So in today's passage, we read about Jesus healing a deaf and mute man by putting his fingers in the man's ears and then taking some of his, his spit, it seems, with his own fingers and putting it in the man's mouth on his tongue. An interesting and strange to us thing that Jesus does, but I think that the meaning of it is beautiful and it connects to the cross in a wonderful way. And so I'm excited to, I always love getting into passages in scripture where you look at it and you go, wait, what? You know, there's like the passages that make you do a second take. And then you find these really interesting things. So we're going to get into some theology about the identity and mission of Christ as we go through this, as well as a lot of apologetics tonight, because this passage in Mark 7, this is where a lot of critics will attack the text and say, you know, Mark's just wrong here. Like, this is factually wrong. That's not really what happened. And so I want to respond to those things as we go through this, because I want this Mark series to be a resource to help people who've been impacted by skeptical teachings. As they find it, they go, wait, there's answers? I didn't know there were answers to these questions. I thought well, all we had was questions. Uh, but no, there are answers. So here we are. This is uh, the 25th um, part of the Mark series. It's Mark chapter 7, verse 31, all the way through verse 37. We're going to read the passage, and then we'll go through it slowly, thoughtfully. Verse 31 says, again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva, and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly, and he gave them orders not to to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, he's done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Um, okay, there we go. That's that. I was just starting to read past my notes, but that's, that's the section we're in today. So it's the healing of this man, very peculiar, admittedly, but intentionally, I think, it's so we can learn from it. So let's start here, verse 31, and let's work our way through. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. Um, now I want to mention this. Last week, I think I mentioned that this trip to Tyre and Sidon, to that area, was on his way to Caesarea Philippi. Now, Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, is on his way to Caesarea Philippi, like he's going to get there, but he's not going directly there. First, he comes back down to the Sea of Galilee area. I just want to offer that clarification. So here he is, goes down to Sea of Galilee within the region of what's called the Decapolis. Now the word Decapolis, polis means city, deca means ten. So it's a region called ten cities, the ten cities. And the Decapolis, according to the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, that region, um, it says during the lifetime of Jesus, the cities of the Decapolis, which had become moderately prosperous trade centers, were consolidated into a Roman alliance against a possible Jewish uprising. So we get two things from that. One, it's like a Gentile area. Not entirely, but predominantly or dominantly Gentile area. The other thing you get is, this is probably some friction between the groups. Because the Jews would look at the Decapolis area in Israel, here near Galilee. They would look at this, even touching Galilee, touching the Sea of Galilee, on the southeastern shore of the sea. And they would look at this and they would see this as like, this is the people the Romans will, will militarize against us if we rebel. That's how they would see these people. So there would be some tension going on there. Um, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus had already been in this location when he healed the demoniac. Remember that? And he heals the demoniac, casts out these, these many demons out of this man. They go into these pigs. The pigs run into the water and they die. The man, he's sent into the Decapolis, go and tell them what the Lord's done for you. But the people of the region, they came to Jesus and were like, hey, would you mind leaving? Would it be all right if you just left? Please just leave us alone because of maybe the destruction of the pigs, and they were bothered by the economic cost of Jesus having been there. That could have been part of it. Um, now that man, though, he was sent out as a messenger. So Mark 5.20 gives us a little bit of background context to the last time Jesus was there. It says in Mark 5.20, and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. So in other words, he kept telling a story to all sorts of people over and over again. Jesus, when he comes back now, they know about him. They don't just know he, you know, pigs died when he showed up. They know more than that. They know more of the story now. Why does this matter? Well, I don't know if the man that Jesus heals in this passage is a Gentile or not. I don't see any way to figure that out. He could have been Gentile. He could have not been Gentile. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but 
the group that seems to be gathered seems to be a majority of Gentiles. And that seems to matter to me. Because we had in the last passage we're covering, the Syrophoenician woman getting healed in Mark, Jesus is doing ministry to the Gentiles. Like to Jews, but also to the Gentiles. But it's a very, Mark gives us this careful framework so we don't misunderstand Jesus' ministry to the Gentiles. It's in the context of the Jew first and the Gentile. That's the whole conversation about little dogs that we went over last week. So in Matthew 15, 31, there's some support for this idea that the crowd gathered. Not only do we know this was a Gentile region, but there's some support in Matthew that the crowd was Gentile because when they respond to Jesus' miracles, it says, so the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speaking, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Now, you don't say of Jews, they glorified the God of Israel. That's just generally not what you're saying about Jews. This is something more you might say of a Gentile audience. So they glorify the God of Israel. Also affirming that they understood the Jewish context of Jesus. He's not just some random miracle worker. It's, he's in this Jewish context. So Mark shows us that Jesus then is the savior of all people, but that it comes in the context of him being the Jewish Messiah so that we understand the Old Testament is telling us who Jesus is from the beginning. And that's super important, especially nowadays when some people are trying to unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament or from, from you know, Christian mentality. There are those who are campaigning for the idea that Christians should just discard any sort of sense of obligation to believe the Old Testament. And this is, obviously this is a fad because the Holy Spirit doesn't support these kind of ideas. It's going to come, it's going to go, but it's going to do harm along the way. So here we go, verse 32. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. What I notice in verse 32 is that this guy doesn't come on his own. Now he's physically capable in a sense, right? He can walk. He's not, he's not lame. He, he can walk. He's deaf and mute. But, or, or at least he, he can make noise, but he can't make words properly. So he has a, a speech impediments of some kind, severe enough to hinder his communication. But a group brings him anyways. They brought him, it says. They implored Jesus to heal him. So it's like some other group other than him. It's a group effort. Now, sometimes in scripture, it's individuals reaching out, like the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus, if I just, if I just touch his, and she's totally alone. Nobody's helping her. And she's like, if I just touch the edge of his garment, I know I'll be healed. Other times it's like groups bringing people to Jesus. And I think we can get inspiration from both of these. Whether it's you going through hard times and you need Christ, it's like pursue him, pursue him, don't quit, reach out to God and he will, he will receive you. He will be there for you. But other times you might look at a friend who needs the Lord and you see in them no passion, no need, no sense that they need Jesus. And so you're, you do whatever you can to bring them to Christ, you know, to drive them to the Lord. And so you can work on that. I think that there's good application there. Um, bring people to God. This is inspiration from them to us to bring people to the Lord. Don't forget, in other words, your evangelistic ministry to others. And this is easy to do. Have you? I mean, I've noticed in my own heart, right? It's easy to just get in the routine of living life where evangelism becomes like, you know, once a year. Maybe you're filling out a Christmas card for somebody and you're like, here's the chance. And I, you know, I don't want to be that kind of like annoying, broken record with people. Exactly. I'm not suggesting that we do that. But we don't want to forget that we have an evangelistic ministry to be light and to bring others to Christ and to be thoughtfully, caringly, lovingly pursuing that in their lives. That's good inspiration for us. Now, there's, there's a conflict here, though. If you take Mark 5 and the healing of the demoniac as the last time Jesus was in this area, well, his reputation was terrible. Right? They asked him to leave. But now when he shows up, it's totally different. They're bringing people to him. Crowds are gathering. So why, why don't they show up and just say, Jesus, please leave again. I thought we told you last time. We don't want your kind here. Instead, they, they want help from him. And I, I think the difference is that it's the testimony of the man. The man has had time to do his job and go around telling everyone what Jesus did for him. So here's what's cool to me. His testimony turned a bad reputation that Jesus has into a good reputation. His testimony. Do you see the application that's there? Some people have a bad reputation of Christianity in their minds. Christians are all hypocrites. Christianity is this, Christianity that, da, da, da. But if we can live a thorough and thoughtful Christian testimony before them, we can become the thing where they go, well, I guess that can't be true because of, you know, Joe over here that I know who is like a solid Christian. and He's a different, you know, I, I once had a cousin tell me, I'll, I'll say this at the risk of it being awkward. Uh, he was like, Mike, 
and he didn't like a lot of the Christians he'd known from where he was, grew up in the Midwest. And he was like, Mike, you, you know, you're, you're like what a Christian should be. And I was thankful he didn't know me well enough to find more of my flaws. <laughs> but, um, but no, I was, I was so encouraged by that. I was so encouraged by that. And that had more to do with character than anything else. But we did talk openly about God. It's not like we hid those issues. So the testimony of a Christian, of a believer, can trump a bad reputation that's caused ultimately by the work of demons. In this case, the pigs that caused that bad reputation. Now, I want to say this, though. It's not your job to make Christianity look good. That's not what I'm saying. You're not God's PR department. PR departments, by nature, are deceptive. That's why they're, it's their job to make it look good. Your job is not to make Jesus look good. Your job is to demonstrate the goodness of Jesus. And that's a very different task. And you go about it in a different way because it's completely genuine. There's nothing fabricated about it. There's no mask. In fact, Christians ought to wear no masks. Church should be the last place a mask is found. Because here we are in Christ, we're we're expected to be these total failures who have complete grace and who live out the work of God in our lives. And so there's no reason to pretend anything. There's just no purpose behind it. So that one can come and, and, and be just be you demonstrating the work of God in your life. And that is the testimony. So we're not fake advertisers. We're living examples. We're representatives to the world and to each other you know, of what God's done in us. And we get this in um, a few passages of scripture. So Philippians chapter 2, it talks about this. I want you to hear this verse thinking about the relationship between you being a witness and the way you live. So we often think being a witness means telling people Jesus is the Lord. And that's part of being a witness. But I'm saying there's another side, which is my actual character. Like me just living out the transformation God brings into my life. The character change. So Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Here's a good New Year's verse for you. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and, crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. So you being a light, you proving yourself to be a child of God, in Philippians is related to you not grumbling and complaining. That's interesting, isn't it? Think about your godly Christian character as being part of your witness. Then in Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 10, it says this, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So I have these, these motives of, loving other people, helping others, representing Christ through godly you know, behavior, not a mask, but just living out the life of Christ in, in this world, and that that is how I'm light in the Lord. So it's, it's, it's important. It's important. The, the preaching is, is just as, I should say, the, the preaching must be accompanied with godly character. That's the idea. My sharing of Christ verbally must be accompanied with my living, with, living for Christ consistently, it doesn't mean you're not going to fail, but how you handle those failures. Hey, man, I'm sorry. I should have done that. That was wrong of me. That was not Christian of me. Um, that's, that's a godly thing. That's a good thing to be able to do it that way. All right, verse 33. Verse 33 here in Mark 7. It says, Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And there's a few things we can, we can, actually a lot of things we're going to talk about now. Let's, we'll slow down and unpack all this very carefully. First thing though is this, is Jesus is wonderful. I mean, the point here, the primary issue is Jesus is wonderful. He, 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 he heals, up by his power, heals this blind, or this deaf and mute man. And there's like a wonder in Christ. And that's the, that's the arrow that this miracle is pointing to is Jesus and his character and his goodness. But there's a second thing I want to talk about is all these interesting elements of this miracle story. I mean, he takes him aside from the crowd by himself. That's the first one. That's interesting in and of itself, isn't it? Now, I don't think this means that none of the crowd could see what Jesus was doing. They, maybe they could, maybe they couldn't. We don't know. We might be assuming too much. We know he was by himself. There was some aside from the crowd quality. They might have been 100 a, a feet away going like, I can't hear, what's he doing? What's he doing? You know, I don't know where the crowd was at this exact point, how far off they were. Uh, by himself doesn't necessarily mean um, the disciples weren't there. 
because the disciples are almost like the default people that show up for almost everything in the, in the, in the Gospels. They're kind of always tagging along. Um, the 12, I mean. But there we have privacy or a type of secrecy. And later on, Jesus mirrors this, taking him by himself, he mirrors this with the command, don't tell anyone. He tells the whole group who know about it, don't tell anyone else about this thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, the next thing we get is he puts his fingers in the man's ears and he touches the man's tongue with saliva. So he must have put spit on his own fingers and then touched the man's tongue with it. Took his fingers and put them in the man's ears. This is interesting. This is very interesting. I sort of like was excited about getting the chance to study this for lots of hours this week. I'm like, I want to know what's going on here. Understand it more deeply. We see something like this happen again in Mark chapter 8. We'll get there not, not too far from now. About 15 weeks from now, we'll be in Mark chapter 8. And um, <laughs> in Mark 8, he applies spit to somebody's eyes. Right? He makes mud and puts it in the guy's eyes, and that, that heals the guy. Mark 8. So that's interesting. Um, with the Greeks, they did have an idea of the medicinal value of spit. So let me talk about that a little bit, and we'll, we'll see if there's some connection here to Jesus, which... If there's a connection, it's weak. I'm going to say that, but let me walk, th- walk you through it. Um, there's a guy named Galen who's like, he, he was the guy that wrote the Greek text on medicine. He's the father of medicine, they say. Although sometimes when they say the father of and they refer to someone, the guys were actually kind of kooky in some ways. And you'll, you'll see. Galen, he actually said that spit had healing properties. Now, he was born in the second century. He comes after the time of Christ. But he said spit has healing properties. And he mentions a few things. Um, he says that it can... Um, not only heal people, but spit acts like poison to scorpions and snakes. So that if you spit on a snake or a scorpion, they'll like dissolve. Father of medicine, I mean, you know, in some ways he was probably great. In some ways you're like, wait, what? Where did that even come from? Uh, But he apparently thought there was some medicinal value. Now, it's true that spit actually does have some medicinal value. And I'm not making, okay, look, I wasn't on weird websites this week, I promise. Like, it does have some medicinal value. This is why your dog licks its wounds. Now, if it's a giant wound, a big wound, it can actually not help. It can be too much. You know, spit's not miraculous. Not even in this text. Jesus is miraculous, not the spit. We'll get to that in a minute. But it does have some healing factor. They even did a scientific study where they took a bunch of rabbits and they wounded them all. I didn't do it. Don't get mad at me. Um, but then they applied human saliva to the wounds and they had a control group and they, you know, all this kind of thing. And they showed that the uh, ones with the saliva applied to them, they healed more quickly. But there's a risk with saliva that you will have bacteria in the mouth that will cause infection. So there is healing, you know, value there. But there's also the risk of greater in, and much worse infection because of a dirty mouth. So I don't know, I'm just, I thought you would want to know that. Um, but Jesus isn't doing this. Jesus isn't like, here, apply this call me in the morning kind of thing. He's not applying the spit like it's a medicinal thing. It's an instantaneous healing. He commands healing. Like, I don't know how many people are like, here, take this Advil, and now pain be gone. Like, they never do that because medicine doesn't work with commands, you know? That's not how it functions. So Jesus isn't doing a medicine thing, even if they thought it was somehow medicinal. Now, it's possible that he's using his saliva as a way of giving them like a a, something to to comprehend, oh, this is like a healing thing. He's healing the guy. Maybe there's something going on there. Maybe. Kind of weak, though. Now, on the Jewish side, that's the Greek side. On the Jewish side, there's an interesting story in the Talmud about spit. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. It says, and this is from the, um, the Babylonian Talmud, Bava Batra 126b, for those of you who want to look it up. I'll read it to you. A man once came before Rabbi Chenina and testified to him, I am sure that this man is the firstborn. Chenina asked, how is it that you're certain of this? The man said, because when sick people came to his father, he would tell them, go to my son, Shikchat. He is firstborn and his spittle heals. There is a tradition that the spittle of the firstborn of a father heals. Interesting (laughs) and random. Um, I don't, I'm, I wonder how this came about. You know, you've got to wonder. Now, this was written, of course, after the time of Christ. This is, but it's interesting. And if there's any kind of connection to Jesus in the Jewish mentality, if healing spit says, I'm the firstborn, and Jesus was going around calling himself the son of God, 
then there may be a connection there theologically to Jesus healing somebody in that fashion. He might be connecting to their understanding to show him who he is. Um, however, Jesus is the healer, not the spit. The spit is incidental. It might be a, an object lesson. It may be some tool that he, you know, he's using for a purpose. Now let's talk a little bit about the phrase ephatha. Ephatha is um, Aramaic, um, and some have accused here the Gospel of Mark of, of having Jesus using magic words. Now, there were those who used magic words at the time, but their magic words are usually gibberish. The tradition is they're gibberish. They say words that don't mean anything, right? Abracadabra. We, we see this, some of this today, too. They take nonsense words, and they use them. Craig Keener, he studied this and says, Some scholars point out that magicians often spoke unintelligible phrases during healings. Here, however, Jesus speaks Aramaic, which would have been known to most people, Jewish or Gentile, in Syria, Palestine. They don't speak in common languages, in other words, and Jesus is speaking in a common language. It's just Mark's habit to often remember short statements of Jesus in the original Aramaic. He does this when he the little girl says, little girl arise, or, or he's on the cross and he remembers something in Aramaic that Jesus says. Yeah, it's not anything to do with magic. I say this because some, some people like want to mock the text of scripture by associating it with magic or something like that. So uh, some others would also add to this and they'd say Jesus' sigh, when he sighs, it's because this is a difficult miracle. And I've read this in commentaries and I was like, what? And I just want you guys to be armed with this. It's okay when you're reading a commentary or hearing a teacher and you say, the point they just made, I don't know where they got it, but it certainly isn't obvious in the passage. And you just set it aside. This is a good skill. You set it aside. I don't have to vilify the guy. I can just be like, I just have no idea where you came, where you got that from. I'm not obligated to believe it because it's not clear in scripture that that's what's being said. Um, it's an especially difficult miracle because it, because the guy's deaf and mute or imped, impedimentized, whatever the word, I don't know. So the, this is like an extra difficult miracle, except we've read earlier where Jesus raises a dead girl to life and he just goes, hey, little girl, get up. <laughs> and so we see nothing with Jesus in the scriptures having a more difficult time with certain miracles versus others. When he's encountered with a, a, a boy who has a demon and nobody else can heal, nobody else can cast, not even the disciples who've been given authority, they can't cast this demon out. Jesus is just like, get out. Like it's, it's not even hard. So it's reading into the text to say such things. So why then? Why, why the sigh? I think there's, there's an answer that puts all of it together. Why fingers in the ears? Why spit on the tongue? Why the sigh? Why the phrase? Because I think because the man is deaf and dumb. The man is deaf and dumb. And I want you to imagine what he was experiencing. He comes to Jesus. He doesn't know what Jesus is saying. How does he know Jesus is even trying to help him? What does he know is going on? Jesus is meeting the guy where he's at. He sees Jesus look up. In other words, hey, he's helping me get God's help. He, you know, this is, okay, he's helping me access God. That's, that's what I, I see when I see him looking up. He sees Jesus sigh and speak, and then he's like, okay, something's happening. Like, he's doing something here. Because it's all visual for him. There's nothing audible for him to experience. He feels Jesus' fingers in his ears. And I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine it was you. Your deafness would make you very self-conscious, especially in that culture. Nobody is touching your ears. Lest they would catch it somehow. Or catch the uncleanness of it somehow. He puts his finger in your ears. He touches most intimately the very like embarrassing and hurtful and hard problem of your life. And just touches it. He's touching my infirmity, the guy might think. Isn't he worried about touching my ears? People don't touch my ears. People avoid my ears once they find out I'm deaf. Maybe he was nervous. Maybe he felt self-conscious, even embarrassed about his own infirmities and weaknesses here before Jesus. And Jesus is touching him. He sees Jesus take his own saliva and put it on the man's tongue. Do you see that he's now touching the other impediment, the other issue in his life? And he's doing it in the most intimate possible way. In other words, Jesus is putting himself in the closest possible contact with this man's infirmities. This is a picture of the cross. This is a picture of Jesus taking our sin, our infirmities, our weaknesses, and our embarrassment to the cross and bearing it for us. I think that that's what this pictures. I think this is about the cross. And that makes me love this. I think it's beautiful. 
and amazing. And it's when you when you view it from the perspective of the man who was deaf and mute, it just seems like it clicks to me. Now let me um, go, take an aside. This is more apologetic stuff. That was some cool theology, I think. <laughs> But this is some apologetic stuff. Um, is this man's, is this story of Jesus like pagan stories? This is what I got from the OxfordBiblicalStudies.com article on this passage. Okay, the OxfordBiblicalStudies.com article. And already you know, because you have to believe what it says, because it says Oxford. <laughs> well, <clears throat> on their article on the word Ephatha, they say, It's an Aramaic command, be opened, uttered by Jesus, after he had put his fingers into the, into the ear and spat and touched the tongue of a deaf and dumb man and healed him. And here's what it says. A method recorded of other charismatic healers in Hellenistic society and of the emperor Vespasian. So this is obviously like people do this all the time. It's a method. You put your fingers in their ears and you touch you know, your, their tongue. That was a method. You would even think Ephatha was part of the method too because the way the article is written, it seems to be that way. Now there's no... There's no footnotes, there's no references to any sources in this particular article. So, But I can imagine how it would affect a Christian who might be bothered thinking that I'm not seeing God himself in the flesh healing someone. I'm seeing someone write a story modeled after pagan healers or something like that. There's two problems, though, I'll mention with this. First, what Jesus did was not a method. Jesus didn't have healing methods. And if you study the healings of Jesus, you'll see it's not a method because he doesn't repeat it. He doesn't do it twice. He just does this stuff. He heals people in a variety of ways. He could heal remotely, as we see. Is that a method too? Are they going to say that's a method when Jesus... He healed him long distance method. Oh, that was Gerbil Burgle. He, over, he did that too or in ancient Palestine. Um, no, these aren't methods. They're lessons. Jesus is healing in particular ways to teach lessons about himself. So they're not methods. The second issue is this was not a common thing. I wonder whoever authored this little entry on OxfordBiblicalStudies.com, I wonder how common they thought this was or how much of it they thought was common. Which part was common? The spit, the fingers and the ears, the saying of of Ephatha? Which part was common? I don't know. But there's no references, so we can't see. So I dug deeper. So dig deeper. Spent way too many hours on this topic today. This week, I should say. Um, Gundry... In his commentary on Mark, he says that this action only has one parallel that is mentioned by um, our Pash, who did a, did a study of this, and he says oh, there's parallels, but he only mentioned one. And the only one he mentioned was Epidaurus. Epidaurus is an ancient work, we're talking 300 years before Christ, that this, this work exists, and it talks about various like um, miracles stories. And supposedly it's a parallel. Now, it's not exactly a parallel. It's a very loose parallel. And we'll see these parallels that are like loose. We call it parallelomania. Some of us do. Where they just try to find any parallel to Jesus. They're like, that's the same thing. And it's often very different when you get to the details. So I found an article written by a guy named Michael Wojciechowski. Sorry, Mike, if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, and he compared Epidaurus to the Gospels and said, quote. Now, so he did a, just a comparison of Epidaurus, that story, which is the only story mentioned by one guy who says there are parallels in ancient times. He compared that story to the Gospels. Here's what he got. He says, An influence of Epidaurus on the Gospels is not possible to trace. Any relationship, there's no relationship. Any similarities are not establishing a relationship because it's too dissimilar. And he gives a number of reasons. Um, he, uh, he says there's no vocabulary connection. No vocabulary connection. In fact, I'll put, an, I'll put the article in the video description for anybody who's interested. You can click it and check it out. Um, no vocabulary connection between the two works, Epidaurus and then the Gospels. There's no form connection, speaking of like the, 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 I think the method that Jesus is doing, like the order in which, it's not a method, but the order in which Jesus does these actions, there's no connection actually. The scheme itself seems to be different. The contexts are different and the sources are different. He actually names this specifically. He says that Epidaurus is based not on eyewitness testimony like the Gospels, Epidaurus is a work based upon votives, tablets, and reliefs. Like, in other words, people unconnected to the original stories looked at pictures and then wrote stories about them. There's just no parallel here between them and the Gospels. This is why he says, at least among scholars, comparisons between the Gospels and Epidaurus is, quote, not popular. And, um, yeah. Now, this Oxford article, it did mention Vespasian. Did you notice that? It mentioned Ves- the emperor Vespasian did a healing like Jesus. Let me read to you from Tacitus. He's the ancient Roman historian who wrote about Vespasian. He wrote the passage that we're referring to. 
In his histories, uh, book 4, 81, chapter 81, it says, One of the uh, common people of Alexandria, well known for his loss of sight, threw himself before Vespasian's knees, praying him with groans to cure his blindness, being so directed by the god Serapis, whom this most superstitious of nations worships before all others. And he besought the emperor to, to deign to moisten his cheeks and eyes with his spittle. So he does ask him to put spit on his face. Another, whose hand was useless, prompted by the same God, begged Caesar to step and trample on it. So, he, please, Caesar, stomp on my hands. Which I have seen, there are some healers who, modern healers, who actually are violent to people in the name of healing them. And I think that that is um, obviously stupid. And, <laughs> Um, anyhow, Vespasian re regret. It's like, you know, Tacitus writes the whole story. He's like, at first Vespasian's like, no, I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. I put my spit on you. And he's like, I'm not going to do it. And then eventually he does like a, like a, like a risk reward analysis. And he's like, well, if it works, I'll get a lot of acclaim. If it doesn't work, I'll just say that guy was crazy. So he decides to do it. And the guy supposedly gets his sight back. Supposedly it works. And the guy, the other guy gets his hand healed. Here's the problem. The implication, uh, that, kind of floats around is that the Gospels are copying from these other sources, um, which they're not for a large number of reasons. But in this case, Vespasian ruled from 69 to 79 AD. That was long after the death of Christ. Tacitus, who wrote about this, wrote from about 100 to 110 AD. That's the window in which he wrote this particular work. That's long after the Gospels were written. So we have after the time of Christ, after the Gospels were written, we have the first, you know, the only real recorded account that seems like it has any similarity. And it, this is after Christianity is already raising in popularity in Rome. There would have been political reasons to have an, a Roman emperor do a miracle that looked a lot like one of the stories of Jesus. So if there's any borrowing, I would think it's the other way around. People love saying the Bible's copying, but a careful examination shows often, uh, shows it's always not. Um, the Bible's completely unique. Jesus stands alone. Um, it's teaching us Christian theology. It's not parroting something from some other source. Now, there are sometimes similar ideas or concepts in Scripture and in other works, but that's not the same as copying. Generally, when Scripture says something that relates to something outside Scripture, it's often trying to show that it's wrong, that this other thing is wrong, and the Scripture is trying to sort of fix people's viewpoints on those issues. Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about this as a, as a method. Um, uh, again, this is not really a method, but Jesus does use spit twice in Scripture in two different healing moments. He uses it here and then in healing a, a, the eyes of a blind man in chapter 8. Uh, but, but it's not a method because of the variety and the lack of reproduction. Notice that the apostles never try to reproduce the miracles of Jesus. They don't pick one of them and try to copy the same methods. But yet we see this in some of them hyper-charismatic. Now I'm charismatic. I believe God heals today. But there are... Within the group of charismatics, there's those who are, we would maybe say hyper or maybe excited. I don't know. You know, they're, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I just think that there's some things that go on there that we all kind of go like, eh, I don't know if you should do that. And um, they will sometimes try to learn methods for miracles. Oh, when it's this kind of issue, you have to do A, B, C, D, and then you can get, you can get to the healing. Uh, but the disciples never do this. They never even try to copy something Jesus did. And I mean, if anybody's methods can be copied, it'd be Jesus. Well, if it was a method, maybe they would. But it really seems like it wasn't. So there's a couple lessons um, that we can get out of this. One of the reasons why Jesus may have done the fingers, other than showing him he's healing, um, the spit, all that kind of stuff, it could be something to help that person's faith. To help that person's faith. And I want to be careful when I say this, but I do think there's like some legit legitimacy to this. That, you know, when you hold hands when you're praying with people, this may really bother you, but it might also be something where you like, you're just even more focused and more intense and more serious about your prayer because you're holding hands. Maybe when you go and you lay hands on someone to pray for healing, it's not like me laying on hands affects the healing, but perhaps this helps bring up my seriousness and my focus and my faith in that moment. That may be the case. And it might be the case that this is happening here. Just like the woman with the flow of blood, when she sees Jesus and she's like, if I just touch the corner of his robe, I'll be healed. I, I feel like if she had thought, if, if I could just get him to look at me, I'll know, I know I'll be healed. Then when she called out, gee, and he looked at her, she probably would have been healed then too. I think it had to do with where her faith was, not with the action she was taking. So it's not a method, but it is related to faith, if that makes sense. The centurion tells Jesus, Jesus is on his way to heal 
the man's servant, and he tells Jesus, no, 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 don't, don't even come to my house. You say the word and he'll be healed. And she's like, oh, okay, word, you know? <laughs> so the guy gets healed. And um, the point is that it's about faith. Um, and these actions may have been to help faith. But then this leads us to the question very practically in our lives. Should I just make up random things so that people can have a point to have faith on? If you want to be healed of such and such, stand up on your chair. If you want to be healed of such and such, high five your neighbor. Like, do I just make up random things? I think we need the leading of the Holy Spirit in these things. And I need to not be just trying to make stuff happen. I think it really needs to be the leading of the Spirit if this is the case. If this worked all the time, that'd be fine. But often what happens is someone goes around trying their 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 methods they've discovered on person after person after person after person before they rack up what they think is a confirmation. And I'm like, I don't really see Jesus ever doing that. Jesus tried to heal many. Three of them were healed, so we know that, you know, it's we're good. Let's copy that. You know, I, I don't see Jesus ever failing to heal, and we should be aware of that. Because it's not about method. Ultimately, the big lesson is this is about the person of Jesus. It's his fingers. It's his saliva, right? It's his garment. It's his word. Jesus is the source of the healings. Later, when the apostles healed, they did it in one way very different than Jesus. Jesus would just heal people. They would heal in Jesus' name. It's all about Jesus. Every miracle is meant to point us to Christ, point us to who he is. So I'm very suspicious of some of the methods we see nowadays. So the stories of Jesus and him healing people, they are not a handbook of miracle methods for us to try to duplicate. They're showing us who Jesus is and what our relationship with him is. They're not an expectation that when you go out and preach, you should be expected to do a bunch of healings every time. We don't see that even in the book of Acts. Right? Instead, they're pointing us to Christ. Jesus here, another layer of symbolism that might be in the passage is Jesus unstops our ears to hear the gospel and he gives us his words to speak to the world. I think that's kind of cool too. All right, verse 36. It says, And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. So this is to them. He's obviously not just talking to the man. He's speaking to a group of people. In other words, a group of people knew that this man was healed. Maybe he let the man tell a certain number of people and then had, Hey, come here, come here, come here. What you know, I just want you to keep to yourselves. Maybe it was to the man's friends. Maybe they saw Heard the guy was like, I can talk, you know, and then enough people found. He's like, okay, now I want you to hold it off. Don't tell more people than that. That could have been how it worked out. You obviously can't hide anything or hide this fully because the guy can talk. Everywhere he goes, he'll be like, hey, how's it going, Fred? You know, and he's saying hi to his buddy. And the guy's like, what happened? He's like, I can't tell you. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe that's what he did. Well, he didn't do it. We know for sure. He actually went and just told, let me tell you all about it. But, um. But you couldn't hide it completely. So this is this is not a don't let anyone know anything that happened. It's more like a um, restricting of the data of the information getting out too far too fast. That was the idea. Why is this? Um, well, we've mentioned several reasons already. It would avoid an early crucifixion of Jesus. It would keep the crowd from rioting and fighting the Romans, which they're prone to do at that time. And it would avoid a mob-like situation where Jesus can't even minister because everyone's crowding him and not listening to him. They want... Do, fix me, heal me, but not listening to his teachings. That could be the case as well. But here's another possibility. When Jesus heals a man and then says, don't tell people about this, it's like Jesus is saying, what I'm doing is more than this healing. This healing is not the full story about who I am. So it's more than that. The healing is a testimony to Jesus, but his great work is yet to come, and it's the cross. And it's after the cross where everyone's to go out and tell everyone everything. In other words, Jesus is saying, you can't interpret these miracles properly without the cross. You can't interpret what I am, who, what I'm doing, how I'll save and help people without the cross. The cross is the crooks of the matter, pun intended. So Jesus didn't want his miracles proclaimed, yet here they are in the gospel. So it was just a not yet issue. It was not yet. First, get the context of the cross and then tell everybody. Verse 37. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Don't miss the point here. The miracles, again, they attest to who Christ is. And there's some interesting Old Testament significance of this. So the word that's used in, um, in Mark here to refer to him being mute, this, this guy being mute, it's not exactly the word mute. It's, it's a different word that means something similar. It was like he couldn't speak well. Different translations handle that word differently. But it's only used twice in the whole Bible. It's used in Mark, 
in this passage, and it's used in Isaiah 35. The only two places it's used. Now, we've already seen, if you've been with me in the Mark series, that Mark constantly ties the glorious identity of Christ to the Old Testament using these kinds of, you know, references, these sort of ways of communicating, like when he walks on water and how that had this incredible Old Testament significance. Isaiah 35, 6 is the passage, and Isaiah 35, 5 weighs in as well. That's basically, um, Isaiah 35, 6 talks about the healing of the mute, same Greek word, only use one other time, that it's something that happens in the Messianic era. So when they're like, he even heals the mute, in the Jewish mindset, that's like saying, he's doing the Messianic stuff, right? This is confirming the title and the person of Christ. But there's another connection, because Isaiah 35, verse 5, it says this. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Now, that word unstopped is a similar, it's, it's Hebrew instead of Aramaic, but it's a similar word as ephatha, meaning, it means open up. So here we have two connections from Mark to Isaiah 35, which is a messianic prediction passage. So Jesus' his work is connected to the Messiah. That's the idea. Okay, now I want to um, connect us to an uh, Old Testament or excuse me, a, a, a New Testament apologetic issue. And it has to do with the geography of Mark. This passage in Mark is one of the um, highly ridiculed passages by skeptics, by those who, or I would say are Bible critics. I, I should put it that way. They're critics of the inspiration of scripture by God, many of them. And it's, it has to do with Mark 7.31. So let's read the verse again and notice the geography of it, right? He went from the region of Tyre, went out from Tyre, and came through Sidon, to the Sea of Galilee within the, within the region of the Decapolis. Now, the objection goes like this. According to Mark, Jesus went from Tyre through Sidon to Galilee. In other words, it has Jesus going north in order to go south. Galilee is south of the Tyre area, southeast. Tyre uh, is to go from there to Sidon. you got to go north. So he went like north 22 miles to then go down south. And they say that just doesn't make any sense. Dennis Nineham, in his uh, work, The Gospel of Mark, on page 40, says, the evangelist was not directly acquainted with Palestine. When he says the evangelist, he means Mark, the author of the gospel. They often call them the evangelists. Gospel, yeah, evangelist, yeah. So he says he, he didn't know Palestine. Mark didn't know what he was talking about. He's just wrong. Fiem Perkins, another commentator, he says, the geographical route used to bring Jesus back to the Sea of Galilee from Tyre makes no sense on the map. It doesn't make any sense. Kurt Nieder, Niederwimmer, sorry, I have a weird last name too, Kurt. Don't, don't be offended. Uh, he considers it futile to reconstruct an actual historical journey from the geographical details given. It's like there's no point in trying to say this it happened this way. <laughs> Marx gives us geographical nonsense, in other words. Frederick Grant, he says from 731, he concludes that the author of Mark's gospel was, quote, certainly unfamiliar with the geography and topography of northern Palestine. So you, now you get what I mean. Like they go to town to discount Mark and his knowledge of the things he's talking about in, uh, in this passage because of this verse. Now there's one other thing they'll offer as further support other than just the, the location, Tyre, up to Sidon, down to Galilee. They say that Matthew knows Mark is wrong. Matthew, know, Matthew the author of Matthew, knows that Mark is wrong. And this is why Matthew omits Sidon from his story when he talks about the same thing in Matthew 15. So he doesn't mention Sidon because he knows this sounds silly going up to Sidon to come down to Galilee. So he just skips it. Let me give you two different answers that I think are either one is sufficient to respond to all this. Um, it's more smoke than fire. Let's put it that way. Um, first off, there's the topography answer. This is something uh, Dr. Tim McGrew suggests. He says that if you wanted to walk in a straight line from Tyre to Galilee, I'll, I'll reverse my head here because, uh, not literally, but <laughs> Tyre to Galilee, there we go. So here's Tyre on the coast. Here's the coast, the Mediterranean Sea and everything. Here's Galilee down here. Um, if you want to go straight from Tyre to Galilee, that there's a problem. You can go in a straight line, sure, but Mount Marin is in the way. Tyre's at sea level. Mount Marin is three quarters of a mile high, and the Sea of Galilee is actually below sea level by 700 feet. It's the lowest um, freshwater body of water on the planet Earth, actually. And so it's below sea level. So the path would be Tyre at sea level, Mount Marin, three quarters of a mile high, Sea of Galilee 700 feet below sea level. This could be a problem, right? Because people don't have teleporters that to, to just go places. They have to like, they don't even have like our kind of roads or vehicles. They're traveling. So his solution is, 
you, you, you find um, Jesus going up to Sidon to have a, an easier path to walk down to Tyre, or excuse me, uh, to uh, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. Um, one advantage Tim McGrew points out is that this would put Jesus and his disciples along, along a river on their journey down to Galilee so that they would have fresh water, access to fresh water, which is, we think it's not that big of a deal, especially since most of us, we don't drink water, we just drink coffee. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but, but no, I mean, water is pretty precious and important, and you can't always carry enough with you. So traveling along a, r a route that has fresh water is actually very important. So that's, that's t what Tim McGrew suggests. Um, there's an actual pass there, and it would give them water to drink. And this may be supported by the idea that Jesus, it doesn't say he went to Tyre, does it? It says he went to the region of Tyre. He could have been much further north than Tyre. He didn't have to go 22 miles to go to Sidon. He could have been halfway there in the region of Tyre, for all I know. <laughs> Now there's another option, a second option, and that is that um, Jesus had a reason to visit Sidon, visit Sidon because every one of these guys just assumes that are criticizing Mark here, they just assume that Jesus had no reason to go to Sidon except as a shortcut to get to Galilee. And then of course it seems silly to them as a shortcut to get to Galilee, you go to Sidon. But where does Mark say that? It just says Jesus, he's in the area of Tyre. He goes to Galilee, but he goes through Sidon. That's it. It'd be, it'd be geographically weird if Sidon was in Ireland, right? But, but not if it's something you can actually walk to in Palestine and you can get down into the Sea of Galilee. I don't understand the objection, to be honest. It's, it seems like we're making much ado about nothing in this, in this particular case. <laughs> they just assume that um, Sidon's supposed to be the quickest way, and it may well be that the topography is the reason. I don't. Maybe that is exactly the solution, but... Um, I think what we can learn from this is that sometimes critics, they too quickly dismiss scripture and they assume something about the text and then they make fun of the text for the thing they assumed about it. So in a sense, they're making fun of themselves. I don't know. All right. Last question. Why did Matthew omit Sidon? Because to me, that's, that I think gets people. Wait, Matthew omit? They do this all the time. They're like, that's why Matthew cut that out of his account. Matthew has all kinds of things that Mark shares that he doesn't share. It's like all the time in Matthew. If you have a story in Mark and Matthew, Mark gives more details. That's just the general rule of thumb. So then you can start making up reasons why. But it's just Matthew's normal routine. He just doesn't offer as many details as Mark. But, but, in Mark 7 and in Matthew 15, we have additional reasons to think why Matthew shortened the story. Mark gives seven verses to this story. Matthew gives three. Why didn't he include Sidon? Well, because he has three verses. The guy's got like two sentences he gives for the whole story, so he doesn't include as many details as Mark. That's natural. However, in Matthew, he does mention Sidon. And this is where I feel like this, the, the critic isn't doing their homework, and they should be held accountable for that. Like, come on. In Matthew 15, 21, just before this passage, it says Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. So he does put a mention Sidon, he just mentions it early along, kind of heading up this section in Matthew instead of explaining it in detail like Mark does later on. In other words, fail. Um, so, so there we go. That's the apologetic stuff. And for, for this series that I'm teaching, I, I really want to cover apologetics in the Gospel of Mark a lot um, as we go through because not only do you hopefully find it encouraging and equipping to hear an objection and then an answer like that, but also because I know there's someone who's going to watch this who's been influenced and affected and impacted by critical um, commentators or teachers. And when they get this content, my hope is that it restores their trust and faith in God's word because they realize that... Um, it's reliable that we can trust what God has given us. I mean, there's some security that we, we, we really need in our hearts of just resting in the truthfulness of the scriptures. So um, here in this passage, my conclusion is this. We see Jesus, when he puts his fingers in this guy's ears, I think of the intimacy of that. He's connecting with our embarrassing weaknesses, and this is like the incarnation itself. From beginning to end, Jesus is connecting with our embarrassing weaknesses our weaknesses, our nakedness, and our shame. And he's coming into contact with it that he might remove it. Remove it through his own self, through his own work, that we be restored to God. I think that it is absolutely beautiful. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word that stands the test of time and the critical analysis. 
your word that gives us the theology and the good, the goodness of the truth of Christ that we need so badly in our lives. Lord, tonight, may we, may we be a people who recognize the intimacy through which Christ took our sin. You didn't just forgive us from a distance. You took our sin upon yourself. You died in our place. And we are, we are not standing here even just ashamed sinners forever, but rather the, the guilt and even the shame is taken away in Christ so that we can rejoice in Christ and we can have fellowship and communion in the joy of the forgiveness of our sins, of our salvation, of our free and total redemption being restored to you. We love you. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.